welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord. We want to share with you the words of Maximilian Mary Colby. I am a Catholic priest. I want to take this man's place. How does a man give up his life for someone he has never met before? A baby destined to become a saint was born on January 8, 1894 in a modest one-room flat where the family ate, slept, worked, and prayed. He was baptized Raymond. His mother said even as a boy he was gentle and kind. After he died, his mother said, I knew right from the beginning he would die a martyr. When he was about 10, she'd become irritated with him. Raymond, who knows what will become of you? Days later, she spotted him praying in front of a crucifix. He explained when she chastised him, he'd asked the Madonna what was to become of him. Our Lady held two crowns in her hands. One, he would remain pure, and the other, he would be a martyr. He'd chosen both. In October of 1907, Raymond left his family to begin life as a Franciscan. He became Friar Maximilian on the 4th of September, 1910. And on November the 1st, 1914, he made his final vows. After his ordination, he wrote, For the future, therefore, I place all my trust in Mother Mary. His spiritual director testified, Never in my life have I met anyone who loved the Madonna more than Father Colby. He was a true son of Mary. This man who was seriously sick most of his life had the might of an army and the determination of a general. But when the friars sang, I will go to see her one day, he became a child again. However, this was not the time for children. Dreamer of dreams, apostle and zealot, it was Catholic Camelot, and he was to be her Knight of the Immaculata. He shared with his closest companions his dream of an army which would defend the Immaculata, her son, and his church. January 1917, Father Colby and his six knights knelt before the Immaculata's alt altar and consecrated themselves to Mary. The Militia Immaculata was officially founded. Their magazine, The Knight of the Immaculata, was part of the dream right from the very beginning. Mary was calling them to make her name known through communication. Not even landing in the hospital with tuberculosis could stop Father Colby. He'd walk through the wards preaching, reaching Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Father Colby was released from the hospital April 1921 and started up his first publication of the Knights of the Immaculata eight months later. They immediately had money problems. His superior had given permission, but took it back. Father Colby begged Father Provincial, just give me the permission, I'll find the money. When it looked as if his first publication was to be his last, some priests made a very sizable little donation. With that, Father was able to cover half the cost. Back he went on his knees. As he started to leave, he spotted an envelope on the altar with the writing, for well, you, Immaculate Mother. Inside was the exact money he needed. During the first year, they had to change printers five times. Strikes held up delivery. The price kept going up. Father Colby had a thought. He'd open a print shop in the friary. Next thing you know, Father Colby needed larger facilities. A prince offered some acreage to Father, who immediately placed a statue of the Immaculata on it. There was a little encounter that uh, Maximilian Colby had with the prince. It was supposed to be no cost, no deals, no strings yeah. attached. And, and, the, and the prince agreed to that, but then just as they were getting ready to formalize the, right. the deal, he said, I want masses celebrated for mm -hmm. me here. Uh, his superior had made that condition. Nothing, not a penny mm -hmm. was to be paid for the land. In no way, no recompense. So he told the, the prince, I'm sorry. We this can't do that. It cannot be done, it must be freely given. So the prince said, well then, forget about it. And so Maximilian Kolbe turned to our Blessed Mother and he said, well, he said, she let me down, but it's the first time that you ever let me down. And suddenly the prince looked at Maximilian Kolbe and all he saw was a little boy who was hurt, who was disappointed with his mother. And 
he let him have the land. The city of the Immaculata, as it became known, began with two priests and 18 brothers. They chopped their way through dense forest, using its wood to build a chapel, dormitories, huts for the equipment, workrooms, and offices. The Polish winter came too soon. Days were long and work endless, but as they were of one mind, one heart, and one vision, the struggling and suffering only made them stronger and more determined. They sweat together. They cried and laughed together. They were brothers. They became community. Their provincial jokingly told Father he needed more priors. He'd have to build a seminary. Father began building immediately. The provincial was upset. Father had taken him seriously, but it was too late. The announcement was in the night of the Immaculata. Letters poured in. Men of all ages from all walks of life wanted to come and give their lives. Building after building was added. The prince gave them more land. The friars grew from 20 to 800. And the Immaculata became the largest religious community in the world. During the first five years, they added a college, a novitiate, a friary, a hospital with 100 beds, an electrical power plant, and a fire department. Communication was on the move. They added a radio station. The work was to go worldwide. They built an airport. The circulation of the Knights of the Immaculata swelled to a million copies per issue. It was exciting. But with success comes envy. A cannon needled, what would St. Francis say if he was still living, seeing these expensive machines? Father Colby retorted he would roll up his sleeves and speeding up the machines as much as possible, he would work like these good brothers to diffuse the glory of God and the Immaculata with the most modern means. On September the 1st, in the year of infamy, 1939, without even a declaration of war, Hitler's ruthless army invaded Poland. They didn't have a chance. On September the 5th, Father Colby told his knights to go to friaries or to their families where they'd be safe. Tearfully, they held on to each other. He blessed each of them, saying, Goodbye, my dear sons. I will not survive this war. Most of his knights safely gone, Father Colby left for Warsaw to ask his provincial what he was to do. Although he did not seem anxious, those present later testified he didn't want to die. The provincial ordered Father Colby to stay at the city of the Immaculata. It was a death sentence. The city was right in the path of the advancing German army. Father said yes, and with him 50 brothers and five priests. As each hour made its slow journey into night, the commitment became more difficult. They spent every day from September the 8th through the 19th terrorized and crippled by fear. All that is but Father Colby, who gently reminded them this could be the last day of their lives. They were to prepare to die a holy death. The middle of September, soldiers rushed from building to building, destroying everything. Did they remember something from their mother's knee they needed to forget? They ripped crucifixes off the walls and stomped them under their heavy boots as if to crush the Christ on them. They ground statues of the Immaculata into dust as if she were there reminding them of the new Calvary they were creating. Father stood helplessly by and saw them mercilessly tear down everything they'd built. In a matter of days, they shattered a dream that 12 years of sacrificing had made a reality. He repeated over and over again, the Immaculata has given all, she has taken all away. The city of the Immaculata was turned into a hospital. It was available not only to the wounded, but to those who were considered undesirables. The number rose to as many as 2,000 dissidents and 1,500 Jews. Brother cared for brothers cared for physical wounds. Priests were chaplains to Catholics and brothers to Jews. Conversions came about. By some miracle, Father Colby was able to convince the German propaganda office to allow him to resume the Knights of the Immaculata. On December the 8th, 1940, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, Our Lady gave the world Father Colby's last will and testament. 9.45 a.m., February 17th, 1941, five Gestapo officials came for Father Colby. He and five other priests were taken to a prison in Warsaw. 
As days passed into weeks, Father spoke repeatedly of dying a martyr's death for the faith. One of the brothers objected, you, Father, speak of martyrdom for the faith. While there are many people who are in concentration camps perishing, this is not for the faith, but for the country. Father answered prophetically, Son, the martyrdom is certainly for the faith. All religious wars, all wars are religious wars, not between countries or people, but between God and Satan. And certainly this war with its inhumanity against God's children was not political to God. Ask parents whose sons or daughters die if it's political. They'll tell you it's personal. So when anyone of us is hurt, God is hurt, and so is his church. May 28, 1941, Father Colby was transported along with 320 other prisoners to Auschwitz. He was treated no better because he was a religious. Rather, they were harsher on religious, taking some kind of delight, determining how much torture they could take before cracking. Guards pushed, kicked, and beat him when he was too ill to walk. They made him haul wheelbarrows full of gravel needed to build crematorium walls. No matter how they brutalized or tried to humiliate him, they could not force Father into hating them. He had so much love in his eyes, they made him lower them so he wouldn't have to look into them. Auschwitz was not originally for the extermination of Jews. The Third Reich executed undesirables from every country they conquered, whose only crime was they were leaders or intellectuals. Then in 1941, they added the Jews to their martyred numbers. Although its horrors was not singularly its own, Auschwitz had the reputation of being the most efficient of all the concentration camps with a record of exterminating 3,500 enemies of the state in 24 hours. Once a month, they, there was a court. The 200 prisoners in two hours was less than a minute a prisoner. So he, that was his full time for defense and sentence. Justice. I wonder, at, at the Nuremberg trial, how much time they got. The prisoners would have to undress here before the ones that, that they had passed sentence on, they undressed here and then they were executed at the wall naked so that these uh, uniforms could be used for the next prisoners. This, this is the corridor where those who were sentenced were led out to the courtyard and to the right to be shot. Dearest Lord Jesus, we come at this spot where the hearts and the thoughts of those who were being shot by the firing squad are only basically really known to you. I'm sure there were many cries of anguish, many cries of fear, much trembling to believe that here innocent people were being shot, lives being snuffed out. We remember their memory, but we pray for their souls, that, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, in your divine love and mercy, through your precious blood, which you shed on the cross for all of us, will bring these people to eternal salvation. We pray for this today through the intercession of the Blessed Mary Ever Virgin, St. Maximilian Mary Kolbe, who was martyred in the building next to this wall, and through the intercession of all the saints that are maybe unknown to all of us. A prisoner testified that nothing they did to Father Kolbe could break his spirit. He would lift up the prisoners, repeating, No, no, these Nazis will not kill our souls since we prisoners distinguish ourselves quite definitely from our tormentors. They will not be able to deprive us of the dignity of our Catholic belief. We will not give up. And when we die, we die pure and peaceful, resigned to God in our hearts. He infuriated the Nazis as he worked to keep Poles and Jews from turning on each other. To punish him, the guards saved the most demeaning work for him. They even set their vicious dogs on him. They made him carry corpses to the crematorium. One day, Father fell under the weight of the wood he was carrying. Face down in the mud, unable to get up, did Father Colby see Jesus on the cross when he fell the third time? Was that how he was able to get up? With his last ounce of strength each day, he carried his sufferings, taking on the sins of his jailers upon his wounded body as his Jesus before him. He said over and over again, for Jesus Christ, I am prepared to suffer still more. He was an inspiration to everyone.